All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I may have some stragglers here, but um, first of all, thanks for coming to this. Thanks for choosing this one. Um, when I selected this topic, uh, when I selected this topic um, you know, for an analytics summit presentation, I thought to myself, they're probably never going to accept this. There's there's nothing analytics about this. But every customer, every client I work with that I go into that has some sort of analytics or business intelligence challenge always has a component of their problem is data migration. So it is definitely relevant. I'm glad that there is a number of attendees here and you validated that at least some of you have either had this problem before or you see this problem coming. So I hope you find this useful. Um, I will say that this presentation is, is very text heavy. I typically don't like text heavy presentations, but I wanted it to be something that you could take back and reference. So the slides will be available after this, um, as well as if you have any questions, feel free to come up uh, after the presentation and, and ask. So first of all, um, who am I and why should I be talking about this? So uh, my name's Matt Dean. I've been doing this for a little over 15 years now. I've worked in all kinds of different industries, everything from financial services, healthcare, not-for-profit, all across the board. I've been a consultant for most of that time, so my background is really in a little bit of everything, uh, custom software, business intelligence solution, quality assurance solutions. Um, so I've got a good breadth of both types of software I've worked in and types of projects, types of customers I've worked in. So I'm not gonna give you the sales pitch, I'll give you the short version. If you're interested in knowing more about CGI and the company I work for, please come and, and talk with us afterwards. We also have a booth here. Um, but a lot of people don't know who CGI is, so I just do want to spend just a second on telling you who we are. So, uh, founded in 1976, we are a Canadian-based firm, but in the U.S., we have over 11,000 employees here. Globally, about 77,000 consultants. Um, so, here in, the Na here in Nashville is where I'm based, so I typically do not travel. Um, I'm based here, and I serve Nashville clients, and we have a team here that does that as well. Uh, what sort of differentiates us? Uh, a couple key things. First of all, we really like to have our employees, our members as we call them, invested. So over 80% of our members are shareholders. We have a pretty generous share purchase program that lets our employees uh, be a part of the company. So that really gets them more invested. As I said, we're based here, I'm based here in Nashville. Our Nashville office has been open since 2012. Uh, we have around uh, a little over 50 or so people here in the Nashville office that are serving local clients. We've worked with over 40 different local companies here in the Nashville area and we're located down in Franklin. Uh, one of the things that's very important to us here in the Nashville office is our community involvement. So uh, you'll see a lot of our team members out in the community, whether it's WIT or Department of Education or Williamson County, staying pretty involved, as well as involved in uh, events like this, uh, both presenting and organizing. So um, without spending more time on that, let me get into why we're here. So hopefully, hopefully this is why you're here. Hopefully you're not in the wrong place. Um, but what I'm going to cover are three, three major steps. So first of all, what is the problem? How to spot it? So what are some of the questions you should be asking for? How you, should you be digging into and understanding? Am I going to hit a snag? Am I going to hit a problem on data migration? Second of all, what are some of the most common mistakes that we see? And how do you actually address those, head those mistakes off? Um, I didn't put those in any particular order, but they're all pretty interesting. I'm going to try to, as I talk through all these, give real examples. So, You'll see on the slides, as I said, kind of text-based descriptions of what some of the problems are, but I'll try to sprinkle in real examples from real customers over the years. And then finally, once we've gone over the mistakes, what should you be doing? How should you be properly planning for data migration? What should that look like? How do you estimate it? How do you, how do you say how big it's going to be? So to jump right into the problem and how to spot it. So first of all, pretty much every enterprise software system, whether you're buying an off-the-shelf system to implement, whether you're building something custom off the ground, is gonna have to move data from one system, some legacy system maybe, maybe a third-party system, and get that into the new system, right? Um, but the problem we see a lot is that most of those teams implementing that, whether it's the program manager down to the DBA who's designing the new data model, is they just don't simply give themselves enough time to do this well, to do this accurate, and to do it right. Um, I'll give you one, one quick story. Um, as a consultant, one of the things we end up doing a lot is trying to bid on work, right? So somebody's got a problem they want to solve, they put out an RFP or some kind of informal process to say, here's our problem, help us solve it. I had a customer who knew they had a big problem, so this customer did distribution of 
periodicals and that sort of stuff. So they knew they had a problem with their old system because they would kick off their, week, their jobs on end of the day. They would kick them off on Friday afternoon at 5 o'clock as early as they could, and they would run all weekend. And they would finish, if they were lucky, Monday morning at 8 a.m. so they could generate all the reports. This had just been over years and years of their system, you know, making changes, adding rules, special exceptions, special cases. They knew they needed to get ahead of this because they, be, they couldn't be agile. They couldn't respond and, and adapt to what their customers were asking them to do because they were just stuck with this process, right? They put out an RFP and they said, we need someone to come in and A, design a new data model. Like this thing is just really hard to dig in and get analysis on. We can't get data out of this. I'm just not sure we're, we're getting the right data to our customers and we're able to, to sell and convert them. The other thing is we gotta have a process. We can't just stop this thing one day, take forever to move all the data over and, and, and reboot one day on a new system. That's just not gonna work for us. So they put out this RFP and it went to a bunch of big names. Um, it went to like firms like MySQL and places like that. Definitely big names you would recognize. And we were a smaller shop, you know, local, didn't have a whole lot of people came to us, we put in our bid for that, and they came back to us and said, we really like what you guys propose. We think it's great, and here's why we want you guys to do the work. You told us this was gonna take eight weeks. Granted, now all they want is a plan at this place. We're not actually executing. They just wanted a plan. Come in and look at what we have and give us a plan. You guys told us it was gonna be eight weeks. Everybody else, even the experts, you know, we're running on MySQL today, those guys said, yeah, we'll get it done in two weeks. You clearly looked at what we gave you, our RFP materials, the detail and the complexity of our system, and you guys understand more than that they did that this is a big problem. This isn't something that's just gonna get turned around in a week. So that's kind of the, the root of what I see with a lot of firms, whether it's, another, whether it's a consulting firm or whether it's an in-house IT shop. They just wanna oversimplify things. Building a data model, sure, I'll have that done next week. It's never that easy. So, um, first of all, to spot the problem, Hopefully, you've got a plan, at least. If you don't have a plan, let's start there. Come up with something. I, I had a customer one time whose plan was, well, we're going to go live on a Monday. I got nothing to do that weekend. I'm just going to migrate all the data that weekend. I'm, I know SQL. I'm a wizard. I've been doing this for 10 years. I'm going to copy all the data over. We'll come back to that one. So. so, hopefully, you've got a plan. Let's start with what questions did you ask. First of all, who provided input to that plan? Did you just give it to the DBA? Did you just go to your DBA? He may be the best DBA that, you, that anybody has in the state, right? Been working with the system and knows the data front to back. But you need more input than just the person who's looking at the database every day. We'll talk about who some of those people are. But you should definitely have a broader list than my DBA. How well do you know the existing data? Again, not just the person who's been working in the system as the DBA moving that data around, but you gotta consider other factors here, right? So um, one of the s problems I commonly run into, right, is we go into somewhere to look at a system, we start looking at the database, and the first question we have is, where are all the constraints? Where are all the relationships? What happened? And you end up getting a story, well, you know, five years ago, we were just having this problem, the data wouldn't go in, we tried to do an insert and there's all these failures, we tried to do an update and it would fail, so we just got rid of all the constraints. Whew, that's always a bad sign, and unfortunately it happens way more than, than, you, than you, would, uh, would you would hope, right? Um, so yeah, how well do you know the data? Not only because someone dropped it, got rid of the constraints and put it in there easily, like how has it evolved and changed over time, right? You know, I've heard stories where this field, up until five years ago, we used it to represent this value. Five years ago, we changed, and now it represents this. It means something totally different. So how do you deal with that? How do you uncover that? If you're just the DBA who just did a quick look at the database and said, well, that field is clearly named this thing, so obviously it means that, you couldn't infer from that what it means to the business, right? So how well understood is the data model from which you're gonna migrate? Again, same kind of concept, um, kind of bled into that one a little already. How do we plan to get the data into and out of various systems? So this one gets missed again a lot, right? So um, how are you gonna get it in and out? A lot of times the new system that you're integrating into or the old system that you're pulling data from has restrictions and constraints. Um, it's pretty common to see new systems 
force you to go through an API to insert your data because if you try to insert it directly into the database, the business rules aren't gonna be validated, they're not gonna trigger, and it's not gonna be correct, right? So make sure you know, make sure someone's thought about how the data is gonna be extracted out and inserted somewhere else. Who are the business owners? You're gonna hear me repeat this one a good bit, but it's, it's not just knowing who the owner of the system is, who is the subject matter expert that knows, hey, when I get into this component of the system and we're talking the financial data, who actually is the CFO or the right person that knows what that financial data means and how I can translate it, right? So each, you're gonna have different kind of data domains within your database. Who are the owners of each of those different areas? If there's customer data in there, who's responsible for customer? If there's sales data in there, who's responsible for sales? How secure or sensitive is this data? This one we see a lot, right? Maybe your data doesn't have any security or sensitivity issues. There's no personally identifiable information in there. But if that's the case, you're probably not in this room. You know, I don't know what you're doing. You know, most, most of them all have some of this. But it's uh, typically neglected, especially you know, when you're looking at a new system. Now's a great time to consider how am I going to address that, right? What tools or approach are we planning for the migration, right? So again, this is another common one where people don't think about how I'm gonna perform this. Um, depending on what system you're migrating into or out of, a lot of times there are tools pre-built that are expert or will help you with that migration process and really speed that along. So don't just start from the default, I'm gonna write a bunch of custom SQL code and that's gonna be my solution. Did you at least think about applying tools? Because in a lot of cases there is something that can be helpful to you how many and what systems are involved. It's typically not just a one-to-one -one issue here. A lot of times you're not going from a legacy to a new system. A lot of times you need to enrich that data. So, and we'll hit on some examples of that too. Who will conduct the migration, right? So who's got the time to do this? In your project plan and whatever your timeline looks like, is this just another task assigned to a database developer or a software developer? Do you actually have people dedicated to this who have done this before, who have dealt with data discrepancies and know how to resolve those issues? Great question. And then finally, who's gonna validate that they're accurate and complete? This ties directly to my question about who are the business owners. Hopefully you're, you're thinking that already. Is my business owners the only one who can say that that is accurate and complete, right? Um, and hopefully you're not just looking at that saying, well, I had 100 rows over here, and now I've got 100 rows over here, so it's gotta be right. And then how much do you need, right? So a lot of times legacy systems go back years and years, right? You may not need all that data. Maybe you can save yourself some time and say, I'm gonna archive the past five years and I only need the most recent five years to carry into my system, right? So those are just some great questions to start with, right? If you're thinking about embarking on a data migration plan um, and you, maybe your team already has a plan, you've got an idea, I'm gonna get it done, sprint number seven, yeah, we'll do data migration in there. Run down this list of questions and see if you've thought about those things. So, with all those in mind, you can probably guess at some of the common mistakes, but we're gonna go through some, some of the classic mistakes. Again, these are not in any particular order, but I wanna hit on each of the mistakes and, and talk about what you can do to try to head off that mistake. Uh, so first of all, not identifying clear success metrics. Man, um, this is a tough one because that example I just gave of, I had 100 or a million rows in the old system and I got a million rows in the new system, that's one of the most common mistakes I see, is people just saying, that is how I define success. Well, that's not always the best thing to do, right? So you need to work with your business owners. So first of all, identify all those different data domains. So the example I was using before, I've got customers, I've got sales data, et cetera. Work with each of those business domain owners to understand what would be success to them. Maybe they don't care about customers that haven't bought anything from us in the past year. You know, we just wanna archive those and put them in the old system. That's what I care about. So work with them to get specific metrics. Don't settle for things like 100% of the customers need to be over, right? You've probably got some bad data in that old system. How many people have a system that doesn't have the same customer in there twice? I see no hands, so yeah. So the old million records over here, million records over here doesn't fly because you wanna take this opportunity to clean up some of that data, right? If there's only 500,000 unique customers, why would I create a million with a bunch of duplicates over here, right? So work with your business owners in each of those data domain areas to define a success criteria for their specific domain. Second, or third, whatever this bullet is, 
document the flows and transitions and process that it's going to go through so that you can help them understand when something goes wrong, because it will, or when you find some bad data. How are, are you going to convey to them where that data went wrong, why it's wrong, how you're going to adjust it, how we're going to correct it, right? Uh, because a lot of times, getting into the weeds of a migration process just for business users, they're not going to be able to speak the language technically, but they know when you tell them the customer behavior or why the customer data was wrong or where the, the matching went wrong, we couldn't connect this order with this customer, that's what you need to help them understand. So make sure you work on your documentation there um, of those success metrics. So not enough knowledge of the existing data set. So I hit on this one a little bit before. So take time to understand the, the quality of the existing data set. So the, the way you address this are a couple, couple things. First of all, data profiling. The number of migration projects I see get started without anybody really looking at the data and doing some basic analysis, it's, 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 it's kind of sad, actually. So even if you don't have a specialized tool, even if you don't have, um, you know, you haven't bought the latest whatever somebody's pitching you to do some machine learning or AI on your data, you can get in there and do some basic analysis to say, here's my anomalies. Here's the things that don't stand out. Here, I've got 100,000 orders in the system that don't match to a customer. Those kind of things, before you start planning, before you start executing, are great, right? The more of that that you can do, the better. And then, once you have that data, once you've dug in, please review it with your business, right? When you show up to your business and say, you've been relying on this data for years and years, like, you have this definition of a, of a person who has been certified because they met A, B, and C criteria. Well, guess what? I found these exceptions, right? You know, this, this comes from a real example, actually. I had a customer where they were dealing with certifying various individuals, and there's a lot of rules and criteria that they have to meet based on various states and various uh, you know, certifying bodies to be a valid certified person, right? And we looked at their data, and there were some cases where they weren't meeting those rules. That's kind of scary for them. Their, their reputation is on the line there. That's an important part of what they do, right? So take that to your business. Don't just keep it to yourself. Take it to your business and share with them, hey, here's, here's the problem I saw with your data. I haven't tried to put it in the new system yet. We're going to have to figure that out later, but here's the problem with it as it sits in the system today. I know you thought that system was pure and great, but here's the problem. So with that in mind, what you can do is you can start looking for some opportunities can I go ahead and start fixing some of this in the existing system? Because that's going to make my downstream life much easier, right? So look for those kind of opportunities. As you go to understand the existing data set, you might learn more about how you can fix it. Even though you might be retiring or sunsetting that system, it may make your life easier. You're solving things before you get too late in the process. If I were to put these in order, this would probably be my first one. Um, but waiting too late. That example I gave earlier of a customer saying, you know what, I'm just going to do the migration over the weekend because you know, we're going to launch on Monday and I'm going to come in on, on Saturday and Sunday and just copy the data from here to here. Luckily, we were able to get them to start and try that a little sooner. You know, we said, you know what, if it's really that easy, why don't we just go ahead and test it out? Try it right now. You know, it's only going to take you a day. If you lose a day today, what's, what's a big deal, right? OK, cost you a day. So go ahead and try that out. Well, it turns out like the system that they were trying to import data into, in this case, was one of the big cloud platforms that you probably all have seen or are probably all using or you know, know some companies using, um, enforces a lot of constraints, right? They want you, you have to insert through their API. There's throttling, there's limits, there's business rules. You can't just put junk data in there, right? If I've got 1,000 customers that I'm going to try to put in there, as a SQL DBA or I, can, I know I can move from here to here pretty easily in a quick statement, but this way I've got to interact with their API. I've got to follow their rules. I can't just bulk dump thousands of customers at one time. I've got to wait and let their business rules engine process it and give me the results. Well, the good thing was in that customer, we did convince them to try that, and they realized, okay, it is going to take me a little more than the weekend. I need to get a plan around this. Um, so what, what can you do on your project to deal with this? So... First of all, this is not always feasible in every scenario, but if you can, try to set up a migration test environment. Isolate your migration environment from your development environment. So if you've got, 
Whether you're implementing an off-the-shelf product or whether you're building a custom solution, especially if you're building a custom solution, a lot of times with that custom solution, your data model is not set on day one. It's going to evolve over time. And the longer that project, the more you're going to discover throughout it, the more that data model is going to change. And if you're stuck in the same environment where your development team is making changes, it's going to be hard to run your migration code and see the results because they just changed something out from under you. So if possible, try to do that, right? Other thing to look for is how can you break up your data into different domains or subsets, right? Lots of different ways to do this. You know, maybe sales or maybe definition of customer is the most important thing to you. So maybe you can migrate all the customers first, then deal with the orders later. Maybe you have a bunch of reference or lookup data, right? And you've got one system that's the master record of, of this data. That's probably the, a good place to start. Get a process, move that over, set up steps to do that, and demonstrate a repeatable process there, right? So then run your migration code as regularly as possible. Can't stress this one enough. Don't wait till the end to test your code. Run it, see what results you get, because what's gonna happen is you're gonna find this rule that I set up where I thought I was gonna have all these orders match up with all these customers. Turn, turns out I've got 50 customers in my database that don't have any orders. That shouldn't be the case. People can't order unless they're a customer or vice versa, right? Whatever rules you've got set up, right? So run it and then take those results and present them to your business subject matter experts, your business data owners, right? Don't just, as a migration team, say, oh, well, you know, I can just drop those. Nobody cares about those customers if they've never ordered, so I'm just not gonna insert them into the database. Think back to your success criteria, right? Did the business say that was okay? Have you discussed that with them? That might be fine, but until you talk about it, the issues you found with the business, don't make those decisions for them. You could be making the wrong decision. So finally, perform multiple mock conversions before the real thing. We'll hit on this again at the end when we talk about kind of the process and how to estimate it. But the more times you can test and the more times you can make that thing go smooth, because a lot of data migrations, a lot of times I see this has a small time window to be successful. Hey, we're going to cut the system over on the weekend and turn the new one on on Monday. You don't want to be there all weekend working on fixing migration code. Do a couple tests before. Number four. So again, I told you I was going to hit on this one a lot. Not identifying the data owners. I've already, already stressed that a good bit, but knowing who those data owners are and then, first of all, acknowledging that they own the data. You know, whether you're the development team or the data team or whatever you are, if you're not the business owner of that data, if you're not the data steward, if you're not the person who's responsible in the company for customers, you're not the one who should be making the decision on whether this is a good customer record, a bad customer record, I should be truncating this, or whatever I should be changing to that. Again, keep that in mind. So second, design your process to be modular. I hit on this a little bit before, but the more steps you have, I don't want to say make it infinite steps, right? Overcomplicate it, but Make it that there's enough interim steps. You're, you're rarely going to see a chance where you can go direct from one system direct to the other. You probably want various stages where you're combining data, cleaning up data, because across those various steps, you're going to see things break or fall out in those steps. And that is where, at each of those stages, you need to be able to explain to the business why that didn't make it, what happened to this. Um, we had a customer, for example, that was dealing with pricing data. They're trying to price what they sell, and they're trying to price it differently across every one of their retail outlets, right? Maybe it's because there's a certain tax in Tennessee. Maybe it's because there's more owners or buyers of this product, and they're in higher demand in Alaska, or they're harder to ship to Alaska, right? Whatever the reason was, that set of rules had to be very specific for them based on the region, based on the state, all these different things that would apply. So we had to show them no, it didn't fail here. It's a good product. It, it looks good. It only failed because we were trying to, to come up with the price for it in Alaska. All these other states were great. And here's the step and here's the stage where it failed. So you can explain to them and help them understand. We just need, we need a rule defined for this scenario, this criteria for when that happens in Alaska. We missed that one, right? We didn't think we had any retail outlets in Alaska. Those are the kind of things you want to do. And if you can set up a regular cadence for those, whether you're doing sprints, whether you're doing waterfalls, somewhere in between, set up a cadence where you've got that connection with your business and you're reviewing that stuff so they 
have an expectation from you that you're going to be coming to them on a regular basis and they have to be involved in this migration process. That they're just not going to go away and you're going to show up with the new system loaded with data. Set that expectation early. And then, I've, I've kind of stressed that one already, but help them make those decisions. You know, point them to where and why it went wrong and show up with a recommendation. But keep in mind, right, they own the data. You're looking to them to tell you why and yes or no. So number four, taking into account the result, the constraints of the legacy system. So I used this example a little earlier. Like you don't know why that system is built that way. I come into a lot of customers where the system has been in place for a long time and the, the team that is there today didn't build it. They're not, they, they support it today. They know there's issues with it. Maybe there's a business subject matter expert who can tell you why the data is the way it is. Uh, the example I gave of that meaning of that field changed over time. That's very real, that can happen. So make sure you understand why a system exists the way it does. Um, one of the, another scenario we had, we were designing a new system for a customer, right? Brand new, ground up, rewrite our business processes. Uh, it was a multi-year project, a lot of people, big project. And they were taking the opportunity to look at their overall business flow and decide are we doing things the right way? Are there faster, easier, more efficient ways to do these things, right? I've got humans that have to manually review this step, right? Can I take that out of the loop and automate it, right? Well, they were doing business in a lot of cases the way that their old system constrained them. The only reason they were operating the way they were is their old system couldn't support a better, more efficient process. So when we sat down with the business and had them explain the process to us, they would always default back to, well, I do it this way because that's how the system does it. You gotta get them out of that mindset and get them into the mindset of, well, what would be the most efficient, best way for your business to do that? Forget the old system. The reason the old system is the old system is all those things you just discussed, right? We're trying to put in a new system, and that new system shouldn't force you into those constraints, right? So keep that in mind as you're, you're doing your analysis and looking at the old data, old system. So kind of already hit on those, but again, agnostic of what the data model or the old system does, understand the business needs and why, why you're implementing this new system, right? Because that will really help you with making the decisions on how your migration should flow. All right, so number six, you're going to hit a point where you'll have an error, an exception, you know, some need to review, as I've said, review stuff with the data, with the, um, with the business. So build that in from the beginning, please. You know, think about how you're gonna handle those. Each step around your process should account for when something doesn't meet the criteria, the rules that I was expecting, what do I do with it, right? I extract it somewhere, maybe, maybe all I can do is the data was so bad I can just dump it out to a file, that's better than nothing. Come up with some way on each step of your process to do that. So modularize it, right? Build that exception management process in from the beginning, right? Please don't forget this one. <laughs> and when resolving issues, back to this before, right? Again, you've gotta have enough information and data about what just happened, what went wrong, to take to your business because they own the data again. They need to make the decision how to fix it. And then think about this too. Sometimes each of your, each exception, each error you find might just be a one-off thing. Maybe that customer or that order was so unique, there was an exception, and you know I can fix it one time and never have to deal with it. But most of the time, it's gonna be something that's a recurring issue. You know, especially if your legacy or old system is gonna stay around while you're spending two years building the new one, it's possible that that's gonna occur again. So don't implement a one-time fix if it needs to be a recurring fix because the next time that happens, hopefully your rules, your processing, your migration step, somewhere caught that, right? So, using the right tool. So, um, this is an important one. So many times, I said this before, I see this bottom one right here. People relying on, I've got a great SQL team, they're just gonna write a bunch of SQL, and this thing's gonna run, and we're gonna move data from here to there, and we're gonna be done. There are lots of great tools. You probably have some that you already own within your organization. I'm not selling you a tool. I don't care which one you use. Um, but look at the tools that are out there. If you're, let's say, migrating your data from an old version of SharePoint to a new version of SharePoint, there's some companies that make SharePoint-specific migration tools. If you're migrating your, your data from a custom system to another custom system, 
there's not gonna be a tool built for you, but there are tools that give you the building blocks, like an Informatica or some other kind of ETL tool that give you the building blocks to do this migration process more efficiently. They're gonna save you a lot of time and money. So an important part of when you think about this is think about your time window, right? So that example I gave of the customer whose job kicked off on Friday and finished Monday morning, is that how you're gonna do your rollout? Like a lot of what the product or the implementation is gonna to choose to do their rollout will determine the best fit for your tools. So uh, am I going to run the new system and the old system in parallel for a while? So I need a way to keep them in sync? Is my tool support that? Am I gonna do a hard cut over where I have to have this 24 hour window on the weekend where I've gotta get all the data moved in 24 hours? Does my tool support, support that? And again, modularize, and that's where a lot of the tools can, can really help you out. So number eight, so I hit on this, but isolate your migration environment if at all possible, right? So I know in some cases that's not gonna be possible. So sometimes just synchronized communication across teams, right? How are the developers or the DBAs or whoever's responsible for that data model and the changes and the impact to that communicating to the team that's gonna handle writing the migration code, executing the migration, running that. It may be that you can't afford or can't set up a physically separate environment to do this. So figure out an approach, whether it's just a manual synchronization or, hey, we're gonna cover this in stand up or whatever that looks like. Uh, you need an approach for that. Ooh, this one, um, waiting for the data model to be done. Uh, I see a lot of folks that say, you know, this migration will just be so much easier when the data model's done, right? Once, once we're finished with the new system, we've got it designed, and I know exactly what a customer looks like, my data model's done, it's gonna be so much easier to just move the data. Well, and I don't know how many of you have worked with this system, even if you're using an off-the-shelf system, like the data model's typically not done until like the very last thing. There's always tweaks. You're finding something new the business wants, some change to make, and you're always gonna be tweaking that data model. And more importantly, like your migration process will point out tweaks that you need in that data model. So when you start your migration and you try to fit something into the data model, oh shoot, I hadn't thought about that scenario when the customer does this, this, and this. That's very important, but I just hadn't accounted for that when I designed my data model. So definitely important to not wait until your data model's done, start your migration. So what can you do? Find ways to stagger it, right? Are there particular data domains or subsets of data that you could migrate in advance? Hey, I really know customers, I've got a separate system, that's my master customer record, it is my full set of customer data. This is only a subset of that, so I can lock down customer pretty early in the process and go ahead and start migrating that data, right? Whatever it is, you're gonna have different scenarios or examples where there's a better fit for you on what can be done sooner, but try to come up with that plan because your overall program, your overall implementation, that will give you a place to align your migration strategy. So you may also find a way to segment your data. So maybe instead of a customer's go first, maybe it's all data in the past six months goes first because my customer, there's a huge amount of churn and I only care about the most recent customers so I can start by migrating those, and then I'll deal with six months or older, a year, whatever the, the strategy looks like there, but you can definitely come up with multiple strategies there. So another mistake is neglecting to include your information security team, right? Or whoever your legal team is. It depends on what type of company you work for as to who the right group to include here is, but this is a great time. Um, I've, I've got a customer I'm working with where they were, were trying to implement, they're trying to move to a new system and they've got something in the old system that works this way. It's a known commodity, does this, works this way, they're happy with it, but the new system just has a new version. Does the same exact thing that this does, plugs into their email system, right, does the same thing. It's just got a new name, a new version number, but they have to install that for the new system to work. They, they showed up, they got in the middle of a sprint, they went to turn it on, they asked their IT team to turn it on, and the IT team said, wait a minute, information security hadn't looked at that. They said, but, but we're running this old version before, it works fine, you guys are already doing it, you approved it then. No, no, we didn't approve it back then. Like, somehow it slipped through and just got installed and started running, we didn't approve it, so now we need time to approve it. Oh, sprint's blown, not gonna make that goal because we didn't get information security involved early enough 
to look at this thing, even though it's doing the same thing it was doing before, and improve that. So bring them in. There might be some new balls that you're not aware of. Maybe you need to obfuscate your data. Maybe you need to do some kind of, uh, you know, worst case. Um, what I see happen sometimes is they don't want anybody touching the real live production data, so you end up having to do a migration on some kind of obfuscated data. That can add a lot to your migration plan, right? That can be a big pain. So bring them in soon. You know, include them up front. You know, once you've done your profiling and your planning and you can share with them, here's the type of data I'm working with, here's how I'm moving it, here's you know, how sensitive it is to my customers, then they can advise you the best, right? So get that approval early on. So just check in on time. So that's a lot of mistakes, right? So we, and those are all based on real examples. I've seen customers do all of those things. Um, so hopefully, hopefully by sharing those, you can maybe avoid some of those mistakes. Um, but I know you probably also want to know, okay, thanks for sharing all the mistakes. What should I do, right? So let me give you the key. I'm going to give you the key inputs. What do you, what do you want to go gather aside from all those questions and things we already talked about? What are the key inputs? And then, you know, how do you prepare uh, to estimate and get a plan in place, right? So some key inputs, right? So this is a bit of a summary of everything we just talked about, kind of distilled down into what are the things you need to go do to make sure you're properly planning this, right? Business stakeholders and data owners. I, again, I feel like I've been stressing that one a lot. And if you, you feel like I'm stressing that one a lot, it's because it's super important. Make sure you're doing that. Business stakeholders and data owners are involved. Not only are they involved at the beginning, but you've educated them on how they're going to be involved throughout the process. Because as you find data, find issues, you're going to want them to be available to make decisions. If they're not available to make decisions, it can really slow your project. So make sure you have a list of those stakeholders and data owners and that you've educated them on the process that we're about to go through. Second, make sure you've, and <laughs> it's funny how easy this can get missed, make sure you know all the systems and sources of data. You know? So there might be one major system that you're migrating from, but think about this. If you've got customers for the past 20 years in that system, let's say, and you know that some of those are out of date, they haven't ordered from me in a number of years, but for some reason they're still valuable to me, um, and I want to do one of the things the new system is going to do, the business really wants to be able to do better, like physically mailed marketing flyers, right? Um, I know I can get com good conversions on those. I just need to know I got the right address. So if I didn't think about those old customers that hadn't ordered me in, from, in so long being you know, out of date, where would I get their valid address data? Because if I pull it from there, I'm going to be sending out mailings to a bunch of addresses that are old and not correct, right? So another source of the data might be using a third party to validate addresses, right? Don't forget about those third parties, right? Because when you bring your data over, you're looking for opportunities not just to make sure it's clean and correct, but to enrich it as well. It might be that you're pulling, again, like a third party mailing validation address or other places that are going to be valuable to your data. Um, methods of available input and output for systems, right? So I mentioned this earlier. This really is especially impactful if you're dealing with some kind of hosted system or product that you're dropping in. More and more of those, pretty much all of those these days, restrict you from going straight to the database to put data in or out. Or if they do, they don't provide documentation. I've got a customer where they've, they've got a system that has a whole bunch of rules that calculates, uh, calculates important things for them. <laughs> without, without giving away the customer, I don't want to share. Um, calculates incredibly important things about the risk of their customers and the meaning of their customers. That is all done in proprietary business rules layer that the owner of the, the vendor that they product, bought it from doesn't share. They don't document that. They just say, we've got our core set of tables over here. Don't touch those. You can look at them, you can read query them and read only, but don't touch those. If you need to get data out, you gotta tell us because we're gonna run it through a rules engine and put it in a migration or integration table for you to consume. And if it's not in that table, then you don't know that it's valid and has been through the right set of rules and you might interpret it wrong by looking at our core database. So make sure you think about that and ask your vendors that you're working with, you know, just because you've looked at the data model or have access to the data model, doesn't mean that's going to give you accurate data if you extract it from there. Same goes when you're putting it in. You might have constraints. That plan you had of I'm going to import these millions of records in this 24-hour time window might not work because of their throttling limitations. 
And maybe you just need to call them up and say, hey, I'm going to do this one-time data load. I'm going to put all this stuff in over the weekend. Can you give me an exception for that just for the weekend, right? There's probably ways around that. What are your rollout strategies? So that ties directly into what I was just saying, right? So are you going to roll it out over a weekend? Do you need to keep systems running in parallel? Make sure you've thought through that, right? So um, that's largely going to be determined by the overall program, right? That's not a, it's not driven by the data migration. You're going to have to fit into what the program says because the business is going to have to make a decision on how they're going to roll this thing out, when it's going to roll out. You're going to have to figure out how's my mig migration approach going to fit within that. So preliminary definition of data domain. So I'm not advocating go do full requirements up front, um, you know, but you do need to understand all the different domains of data. And again, this, this all kind of flows together. The different sources that own those domains, you know, so if there's a customer domain, what are the other systems? There's typically, most people have more than one system of record or system of integration or system of whatever uh, for customers, right? So you got your, you got your sales system, which may have their order information, but you've got their marketing system, you got your email system, whatever your other systems are that may need to be involved in this process. And you need to understand a customer to me means this across these different areas and those domains. Do some preliminary mappings. So once you've got those systems defined, you got those data, data domains defined, spend a little bit of time, do a little bit of upfront documentation to say, here's how this system and this model map between each other, right? You don't need to have this finished to get to the, this stage, but you gotta get it started. You gotta at least have an idea on how this is gonna flow. A look, at your, look at the tools, right? So those things are gonna feed into, are there some tools out there that can help me do this more efficiently, more effectively, right? So don't forget that. And then back to defining success metrics. Revisit those, cover those. Now that you've done all this work, cover those success metrics with your, with your business. You've done that data profiling, I think that might be on the next slide. But um, you've, you've done some upfront up data profiling and understanding of your needs. Make sure you've got those success metrics defined. Don't wait to the Friday before you're gonna run your final migration to ask the business to sign off and validate that, that this is what they're looking for. And then think about who you're gonna have do this work. Is this somebody whose primary job is a software developer or a QA and, or a business analyst? Have they done this kind of thing before? Because a lot goes into this. It shouldn't be an afterthought in your plan. I'm not saying they have to have 20 years of doing data migration experience, but think about who and what kind of support you need to give them to make sure that this goes successfully, right? Those are all inputs. Consider all that stuff at the beginning. Then to get prepared, once you have all those things and you're ready to go to a slightly deeper level, do that data profiling. If you look up uh, dimensions of data quality, that's a great start. Um, if you're not familiar with that, there's, a, there's some agreement or disagreement on how many dimensions of data quality there are and what they really mean, but look it up. You'll find some good articles on the dimensions of data quality and conduct some basic analysis to figure out how good is your data um, and how is it gonna fit into my new system. Again, review that with the subject matter experts. Go a little bit deeper now on those mapping and transformation rules. So I want you to sit down and go over it with those subject matter experts. You should be able to explain to them, well, we're calculating this price because the customer is in Alaska and it had to go through this shipping channel and it had to go through this. And you need it in a method that they can understand. So make sure you've done those rules, even if it's as simple as an Excel spreadsheet that the business users can consume and say, yes, if you do that in whatever code you go write, I know your magic code, I don't, I don't know that. But this, this is what I need. If you can do that, I'm happy. So defining that environment strategy. So as I said, you may not be able to create your own separate, independent, totally isolated migration environment, but come up with a strategy to work with your development and your implementation team to make sure that you have a strategy for communication and you're not stepping on each other's toes. Development strategy, by this I mean actual development of code. Who's gonna do the work? How are they gonna do the work? What tools are they gonna use? That sort of stuff, right? And then your production and your cutover strategy, because without that production cutover strategy, you can't figure out how much time do I need, how many times do I need to test this and validate it and mock this before I know I'm ready to go. So you've done all that. Now's the hard part is saying, how long is it gonna take, right? Um, so 
What I didn't cover is this. First of all, data migration is just a piece of the program, right? Go figure out what the overall implementation strategy looks like. This could be a massive program. I've worked with, uh, I worked with one customer who was implementing a new ERP system. That new ERP system had team members from CGI, team members from other three-letter acronym consulting firms, a huge team from them, themselves internally. They were all just spread across different geographical locations. Many, many multi-million dollar, multi-year project, huge effort. Um, but there was probably 15 different systems that were gonna get retired or replaced with this one system. So there was a lot of moving parts to figure out how do we successfully migrate this. But at the top somewhere, there's a program manager who is responsible for figuring out how is all this stuff gonna come together? What do all the work streams look like? When do I need to be done with this and this and this and where are my dependencies? Find that person, find that team, figure out who that is because your data migration needs to fit within that. You can't show up and say, I need 12 months to do a data migration when it's a six month project, right? You gotta find a way to fit it in. So work with that person to figure that out. Look for those key milestones that you can align your data team with and figure out how to fit there. So whether you're agile, waterfall, somewhere in between, I'm gonna walk through kind of a basic process that you need to think through. Um, and sort of how you apply that. So taking this process and, fig and understanding these are all the steps I'm gonna have to do when I migrate data is a great way for you to make sure you understand the complexity before you say it's this big, it's gonna take this long, right? So, all right, somebody's gonna write some migration code, whether it's custom SQL or whether it's uh, using some fancy ETL tool or some other migration tool, somebody's gonna write that code. You're hopefully gonna test that code, execute that code, as I said, multiple times before you do that, before you're ready to run it in production. Now, hopefully, since hopefully one of the things you learned is I need to take the results of that and present it back to my business and review that with my business and make some decisions because I probably got something wrong in that code or I missed a business rule or some bad data showed up and didn't meet all the criteria. So I need to review those results with them. Reset the environment, update my documentation, and do it again, right? That cycle is gonna repeat. Whether you are working in a agile environment and that is, fits neatly into a sprint, great, that's good. But if you're in waterfall and it doesn't fit neatly into a sprint, it doesn't matter. You still need to iterate over this. This is going to repeat, right? So find a way that this process is gonna happen, right? So at some point, you're gonna get ready. You've got all your data domains covered. You've tested everything. You're gonna to try to do a mock production run, right? May not be ready for the whole thing yet, maybe you are, but you want to mock run before you get ready to launch production because the last thing you want to do is be up there working on a Sunday because your migration code is bad. So you're going to prepare your environments, whatever environments you need, you've probably got different systems coming together to run that mock run. You do that mock run. Again, review and present the results. Did everything go successful? No, probably not. You probably found something that was wrong. It may not be your fault. It might not be the migration team's fault. It may be some change that some other system made or some other, you know, they didn't install the right version of this other system in my full integration environment. So my thing failed. That's great. It was a mock run. That's what you were here to uncover, right? So you didn't fail in production. You didn't have to drive to the office on Sunday and figure out how to fix this thing in two hours, right? That's great. Repeat, repeat, repeat. So back up, when you look at your schedule and you say this is a 12 month project, how much time do you wanna give yourself? Back up and think through this process. How many iterations are you gonna have? When you've broke down your data domains, your data subsets, and you've said, I need to do this once for every domain and I've got 12 domains. And if I think of, let's say my sprints are one week, I need 12 weeks just to run through this one time on each of those. Not accounting for when something goes wrong and I gotta start over on each of those. So think about it that way. So when you finally get to, yes, everything was successful, that's awesome, congratulations. Now just do it one more time. Maybe two, maybe three, right? How confident do you need to be, right? Because that system that you're moving data from is probably changing, right, in real time. You know, if you're accepting orders every day, you're not gonna ask your team to stop accepting orders for a whole week because all right, my mock migration ran and it was successful. Stop taking orders until we're ready to cut over and then we're gonna turn it back on. No, you can't do that. So 
Do it multiple times, right? Don't accept one mock run and be done with that. So that's what I've got. Hopefully it was, uh, hopefully you picked up something. Um, I, as I said, I've done quite a bit of these over the 15 years, lots of different industries, lots of different systems. Um, hopefully at least one or two of those mistakes on there were something that, because I shared it with you, hopefully you can avoid. As I said, I know those slides are very text heavy, so they will be shared as, um, uh, throughout through the conference. So, what kind of questions? Anybody got questions? And it's two o'clock now. I think we got till two fifteen. No questions. <laughs> First of all, be prepared for that because that's always going to happen. But. Hopefully you can head that off in advance, right? That's why you know, I'm so big on planning and preparing because the first thing you want to do when you show up and somebody has committed to a date because, man, that's, this is one of my pet peeves on data migration or anything is, is somebody has always committed to a date before they actually thought about how big the thing was or how much work it was, right? So all that work we did in the beginning, all the stuff I told you to do, all the inputs I told you to go collect, that's a one way to combat that, right? So when you show up, and somebody says, we got to have this state of migration or this thing done by Tuesday. Great. How did you come to that conclusion that Tuesday was adequate time to do that, right? What are your success criteria? When you say done, what do you mean by done on Tuesday, right? Do I just need this migrated or do that migrated? So, yeah, the answer is you're going to have that happen. But as much as you can, try to head it off at the beginning by backing into and figuring out how you got to that date and educating whether it was your business users who made that date or you know, some other criteria that made that date. Sometimes I've been in a scenario, I, was, I had a customer where they were uh, merging. It was two large banks that were merging and they couldn't set the dates. The SEC set the dates and they had to have things done by a certain time. Like there was no changing. If they, if they didn't have it completed by a certain time, they started getting fined every day. And those are very, very big fines and they didn't want to do that. So sometimes when you start with a date, it forces you to think through your plan and make sure it's uh, going to be running. And you know, sometimes you're going to learn. You're going to learn from those mistakes. So that particular one actually was up there on a Sunday because something went wrong in our code, something we didn't anticipate. We were there to support the cutover on the weekend, and I spent the better part of my Sunday watching a folder where files were dropping, manually moving them into another folder because we hadn't accounted for the load. We hadn't adequately tested the load on the downstream system, and we were overwhelming it. We were moving so much data at such a high velocity. It wasn't even that big, to be honest. But that system couldn't handle it. Um, it had a sweet spot, right? If, if I was, gave it 10 records about to process at a time, it would churn through them really quick. But as soon as it hit 12, and it hit 15, and it hit 20, whew, and it would just die. So we couldn't fix it. It was not our system. It was somebody else's system. We had their CEO, CIO in the room coding up a change for this large financial institution rolling out this gigantic thing that they're going to get fined for if it doesn't go well, right? And the CIO is there coding a fix. So I had to sit there on a Sunday and move files because his system couldn't perform, right? So it'll happen. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thanks, everyone.